I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Wiradjuri elders, um, who are the traditional owners of this unceded land, and to acknowledge specifically their elders past, present and emerging. Um, my name, in fact, is Jock Sarong, and um, I am sitting with, on my far left, although it's not a comment on his pol politics necessarily, <laughs> Tim T.R. Napper and Marg Hickey. Um, and we've got a great little session for you about, this is called Shades of Noir, about their two books positioned in correspondence with their authors, 36 Streets and Stonetown. Um, right, right and right. So what else have I got to tell you? Um, there'll be time at the end of the session for questions and answers. Um, and then, of course, there'll be book signings out the front. You, you're accustomed to how that works now. Um, so probably without further ado, as people tend to say at 21sts, we should get into it. Um, Tim, you have a fascinating background as a writer. Mm. And I, I just want to go through a little bit of this, but I won't do it justice. You've lived in Mongolia, Laos and Vietnam, working in international development, and I get the impression specifically in primary school literacy and getting kids yep. to school. Yep. Yeah? Um, you returned to Australia in 2016 after a few years in Hanoi. Um, you've written mountains of award-winning short fiction and you've completed a doctorate with the marvellous title The Dark Century, 1946 to 2046, Noir, Cyberpunk and Modernity. Fantastic. Um, which says a lot, in fact, about this novel. Um, you are both somehow an adjunct professor and a <laughs> dungeon master. <laughs> <laughs> the dungeon master part's far more meaningful. <laughs> adjunct professor. Um, but both, both ways of making other people suffer. Mm. <laughs> I think adjunct professor makes only the adjunct professor suffer. It's, <laughs> I just... It's a meaningless title at a, at a, a great university. But yeah. <laughs> um, and you're the author of um, a short story collection called Neon Leviathan, a couple of years ago, and now, of course, 36 Streets, which is only, what, weeks or months old? Uh, months. Mm. Came out in February. Right, right. Um, Marg... Born in London, you feel so much more local than that to me. Um, yes, I was only two months when, my, when we moved out to, back to Australia. Ah, oh, okay. My parents were, um, did that hippie trail, you know, that when you go up through it, and then they did all this wonderful thing, and then they were really cross when they got pregnant the moment they got, when mum was pregnant when they got to London. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But they can't talk, because I remember you telling stories about Cutter's End and some of the stuff you got up to as a traveller. Mm. So is that a family trait? Possibly, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, Yes, travelled through the Middle East, South America, Asia, Europe, you've been all over the place, and, and some truly hair-raising um, uh, hitchhiking, as I remember. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, Marg's plays have been performed in Melbourne and Brisbane and New York and throughout regional Australia. Um, Marg also has done a PhD, hers um, perhaps more conventionally on depictions of landscape in Australian literature. Um, Mark's a lecturer, a public presenter and regular talent on ABC Radio. Um, and she has ties to my hometown of Port Ferry, which yes. is why we're mates. Um, Mark does a beautiful little self-description on her website, which I, I thought I should read to you, which is that she writes about... She's using the, the authorial third person here. Um, she writes about people who yearn to be better, who love life and land, and the people whose capacity for hope has been described as funny, heartbreaking and true. Mm. That covers pretty much everything, doesn't it? Oh, wow. It's beautifully done. I really like myself after all that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really good about myself. Um, Marg, can we start with you and the relationship between Cutter's End mm. and, and Stone Town and the way that you're developing Mark Ariti as a character? Mm. So, well, I didn't initially set out to, to write a sequel to Cutter's End, but um, Cutter's End was a, a novel, as you know, Jock, that I wrote um, sort of without telling anyone else <laughs> after writing lots of things in academia for a long time. I wrote Cutter's End, and then when, when I, after Cutter's End was published, I got a contract to write two more um, in the Marguerite series with my publishers. So then I thought, OK, now I've got to take Marguerite to the next step. And I found that really interesting. I really enjoyed doing that because Marguerite is roughly around the same age as me. He's, um, I'm 50, he's around 52. Um, I've got lots of good men in my life. I've got brothers and, and uncles and, and three sons and, and I quite like writing about, about a man, what he's going through at that stage. So I found it really interesting to have Marguerite 
um, at the start of Stonetown, his, his mother has died and he's so, so sad because he really loved his mum and he's moved back to her house. And, and her things are everywhere. Yeah, the things yeah. are everywhere. And, and my mother-in-law died um, sort of towards the end of last year and, that was, and I saw how my husband was with that and, and it's something we all kind of go through, you know, we start to experience when we're in our 50s, I think, that worry about our parents. So that sort of formed, I thought, that's where I'll take... Mark Reedy, that was the idea then. Yeah, mm. yeah. And you say, you know, you enjoyed writing a central male protagonist, yeah. but there's also this circle of women around him. Mm. And in particular, am I pronouncing this right, Jagdeep? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Can you just tell us a little bit about Jagdeep? So Jagdeep, so when I was working at La Trobe in, on the Shepparton campus, when I was lecturing there, my first boss, her name was Jagdeep, Jagdeep Cowell, and she was this, she was the perfect boss because she was tough, um, she was firm, and she told me exactly what I needed to do. But she, she wasn't unkind, but I, I, there was no dithering about. Uh, and I really liked that, because I was very nervous starting my new job. Um, and I often thought she wore a turban, and I'd never met a woman who wore a turban before. And I got to know Jagdeep, and I really liked her, but then she left all too soon and got a job in Melbourne, as she should have, because she was promoted and promoted. Um, and then years later, when I started thinking about a female who was a good kind of foil for Marcariti, who is a little bit hapless, he's a good mm. bloke, but he's, uh, as a lot of good blokes are, he's a bit hapless. And, <laughs> and I thought, to ring true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I thought, this Jagdeep, I really like the characteristics of Jagdeep, mm. a boss, as a boss and as a person. And I wrote, the I wrote it all through, and then I panicked and I thought, oh my gosh, you know, I, I've used someone else's name. It's, it's, not, it's not Jagdeep, the person, but it's her name and her characteristics. So I contacted Jagdeep and I said, Jag, you know, it's Margaret here, it's Marg here, and I've just written a whole book and it's, it's about to be published and it's got your name in it. Is that okay? <laughs> and I said, I will change it. I will change everything. I will. And she wrote back and said, go for it. And then, <laughs> and then she wrote, P.S., I'm thinking of becoming a cop. <laughs> so, yeah. so it was really fabulous. So I've kept Jag in the loop, and I, I it's love great. that in that story, you're not suggesting that she checked what Jag Deep was like. Yeah, yeah, no. It was no. just blaze away. Oh, she just said, she said, go for it. She loved, <laughs> she loved it. So, and then obviously she's read all the books, and yeah, yeah, it's great. yeah. Mm. Um, We'll talk a little bit more about place in a moment, but um, it seems important if you're going to write. Outback Noir, to use that expression, mm. that you have to establish the, the geographical logic of how a town works and mm. the things around it. Yeah. So you've done that here with Stonetown. Yes. Just, can you just explain to us a little bit of the layout of, of how things work? It, it, with Stonetown. Mm. So, um, so place, as you know, Jock, and is, is really important to me in setting out. So I often think of a town that I know very well and I draw a map about that. And it's a country town and... Um, country towns are, depending on usually where the highway is, um, is how they're set out. They're set out around the main road. So I always, um, I draw, I, I draw the town and then, and I have the place around it. And I usually have a place in mind. So Cutter's End, I mean, everyone would know that it's Cooper Pedy, really. It's basically set in Cooper Pedy, and I know Cooper Pedy. I've spent a lot of time in Cooper Pedy. And it meant that you could evoke that highway, which was terrifying. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the that fabulous... It's such a fabulous area around there. And then um, Stonetown is um, loosely based on Burra in South Australia, okay. so, which is another town that I, <coughs> that I know quite well, when I would travel back and forth to go up and down the barrier. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Does Burra have that very distinctive patch of forest just near it that you've described? No, well, South Australia, that's where I felt I got a bit... Because the distinctive patch of forest really is where I go walking in the Mount Chilton Pilot National Park, where, where a lot of us here know very well. Um, and as you know, South Australia is really quite an arid state. It doesn't have a lot of bushland left. However, near Burra, there is a small patch of quite scrubby bushland. It's beautiful um, with a gorge, a shallow gorge, not like our gorge in Beechworth, yeah. but I was able to utilise that. So, um, so the foliage and, and the fauna and all that sort of stuff are uh, pretty right in Stonetown, yeah. but um, the inspiration for the whole thing was my walks through. 
Mount Chilton Pilot National Park. Yep. Yeah, okay, mm. okay. And Tim, I promise we're getting to you in just a yes. second. <laughs> <It's all right. laughs> I just there's a couple of things I want to follow up while we're talking about place. Um, one of which is the twitching. Mm. Um, I loved all of the references to bird species mm. and twitches and what eccentric people. Sorry, twitches. Mm. They they are. Mm. Um, are you a twitcher? How did you get onto this? So and and, and first of all, Jock. We have to be very careful here because twitching, and calling birding. people twitches, yeah, twitches and birders. Yeah. So twitches yeah. is a little bit. Um, so uh, I'm I'm joking when I say this. Um, people no, they're really touchy about it. People do call themselves <laughs> twitches, but mostly in Australia we call ourselves birders. And I would say that I'm a budding birder. Okay. But um, I find the whole the whole concept of birding really interesting because. Um, when I have been walking through the National Park or even in the Gorge, there's been times when I look around and there's a, invariably a man, they're mainly, uh, with a... Oh, and it's terrifying. Oh, it's not at all disconcerting. Well, I, well, I, well, I immediately <laughs> think, you know, it's Ivan Milat or something. <laughs> like, like this. And, so, and, and, I, and I say, oh, good morning, or, or, or we all... So birders, we don't say, shh, you go... And, um, and then I sort of run at 150 miles an hour back to my house. <laughs> but, um, and you've put that in directly. It happens yes, to Margariti, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it happens to Margariti. But, you know, the, there's a bird. I don't know whether I should say about that now. Or uh, the, the, There's a particular bird that mm. um, is in the Mount Chelton Pilot National Park, which is the barking owl. And that, of course, um, some of you here would have heard that it's the best place in the world around here to hear the barking oh, owl. Right. Yeah, it's in... It's endangered, but it, it, in mating times, it sounds like a sobbing scream of a woman. And the first time I heard it, my husband, we woke up and we got torches and we were outside looking for a woman. Oh. That was uh, that was when we were in the Warbies. It, it, in mating terms, it's hard to imagine how that's a good sales strategy. I don't know. <laughs> but it, it, it sounds like it kind of sounds like this. <laughs> <laughs> That, that's actually how it sounds. It, oh. oh, my goodness. And it's, it's awful. <laughs> it's mm. The Barking Owl by yeah. Mark Dickey. <laughs> Inox Conivans. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> uh, Tim, my apologies to you. And that's g'day. Um, Lin Vu, who's also known as the Silent One, is one of the more interesting characters in Australian literature. And in fact, mm. you have to remind yourself at times that you're reading Australian literature. That world yes. is so convincing. Mm. Um, she lives in a sort of a... I won't do justice to this, but she lives in a dystopian Chinese-occupied Vietnam. Yep. Is, is that how you would put it? That's a great way of putting it, yeah. Mm. Um, well, well, tell us a little bit about Lin. Lin is... Born in Vietnam, raised in Australia, but then for... So the, the novel's set in the year 2100. And it, you know, in speculative fiction, you sometimes um, extrapolate from the present. And so I extrapolate that uh, maybe our immigration is a bit unfairer in the future. I don't know. That's a, a wild guess of what might be happening. <laughs> and so she's, she has to leave Australia again. But the key thing about Lynn is that she doesn't think she's Australian and she doesn't think she's Vietnamese. So she's an, she feels herself as an outsider to every culture. And that was partly natural with this character, but also if we're talking about a, a hard-boiled protagonist, which I think she is, um, they're outsiders. Um, and they can be outsiders in different ways. The private detective is a classic outsider because they're not with the police, they're not with the crooks, mm. But sometimes they're a little bit with, with both. They, they can walk through different worlds. So Lynn is someone who can walk through different worlds but not belong to any. Um, and I think one of the things about her is, she's, is her alienation as, a, as an individual, alienation from a country, belonging, place, and that drives a lot of her actions. Um, but she's uh, interesting from a writing perspective. It's interesting because she turned up in a short story and... I thought, oh, yeah, this is a cool character. And then she turned up in a second short story. And then I was writing this... Uh, well, I was living in Vietnam when I started writing this novel. And then she was there again. And I wanted to tell her story. Mm. Yeah. Um, she is, in many ways, a very damaged character, yep. which I, I guess fits with the hard-boiled idea. Um, but fascinatingly, you, you have technology in here that will heal physical injuries. Mm. Um, but the psychic injuries that she's carrying, she carries unhealed the whole way through, doesn't she? Yeah. 
Yeah, and I also imagine uh, memory in noir. I think is is, is sometimes it's, it, it can be a re it's a reoccurring trope in mm. some noir. And one of the thing, great things you can do with science fiction is ask the question: What if mm. we could remove those traumatic memories? Mm. And uh, she has that option. Um, I've written a short story, um, for example, where it was. I explored the question of what's the best use of a technology that could remove PTSD, essentially, remove traumatic memories. Because this is scientists are currently working on this right now. They're doing experiments. But then the, the, what, the, what, the, the what if question is, if you can remove someone's trauma, how much of their humanity and their identity are you also removing? In the best use of a memory manipulation, let's say, is it still wrong? Mm. Um, how much do we need our trauma mm. to define us? And that's Lynn, her trauma defines her. Mm. And, she, um, and she can overcome her physical injuries, but maybe she can never overcome that trauma, even when there is a technology there that can potentially take it away. It's, I was, um, during the week I went to a talk by the English philosopher A.C. Grayling and he was talking about, mainly about climate and technology and short version, it was terrifying. But one of the things he was talking about was exactly this topic that he said that the technology already exists to start tinkering with people's memory. Mm. And his point was slightly different to yours in that he didn't seem worried about the ethics of who are you if you don't have your trauma? But he said the temptation for governments to start manipulating that to their own ends is mm. overwhelming. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's... The, I wanted to... What's the best use of memory manipulation? Well, we'll never do that. Yeah. If we ever are able to do that, we'll only do the worst things. And, of course, mm. the book's partly about that, but the, a lot of my fiction is about that, is, is individual memory and collective memory. But of course it's a metaphor as well. I mean, the technology is a metaphor for what's already happening today. And if we are perfectly capable of, as a society of su suppressing collective memory, um, we are perfectly capable of inventing myth and memory. Mm. And, and it, an obvious example, I mean, you can do an example with any country, you can do that example with Australia, but one of the examples, I, think, I, I don't know if it's in the book or not, is Tiananmen Square mm. in mm. China. Mm. Mm. This, this is the, a very crude mechanism of... Uh, I'm wearing the shirt, 1984. A 1984 mechanism of, well, we're going to rewrite history books and so on. But the really interesting form of memory manipulation is that a society understands that it's not in their interest to remember it anymore. Mm. Mm. And so... Tiananmen Square is forgotten. That's without technology. We can do it already. Mm. But yes, I, and so in a sense, it's both... You use technology and science fiction both as a metaphor, which I did, because it's a metaphor for what's already happening today, but also as an extrapolation on the technologies they're already planning to use in memory manipulation and saying... And again, science fiction can be the literature of warning. It's saying, you know, like Handmaid's Tale is the literature mm. of warning and 1984 is and so forth, Brave New World. If we don't stop, this is where we're going. Mm. Mm. Uh, and it's very pertinent to um, Vietnam and China because these are the two... It's said that the, the novel's set in Vietnam because these are two countries that have... who do suppress memory and evoke others and... Trauma, especially if you look throughout Vietnamese history, is something that has been suppressed. The memories, especially of the Vietnam War, the trauma of that war, denied even by, not just that it's been whitewashed in, say, Hollywood, but by the Vietnamese government as well. Mm. Um, which, so now I'm starting to get off track. But mm. yeah, we, but I did want to tackle that question because trauma has been and memory has been suppressed in Vietnam for so long, and it's just a handful of their writers who are really talking about it um, and really exploding some of those myths. Mm. But I feel like, um, you know, our natural reaction to hearing that is how could a society mm. suppress their memories in such a way? But we have a war memorial that's full of Anzacs with no reference to the frontier. 
So we, we do it anyway, don't we? Of course we do. Of course we do. And, and this is... Uh, collective memory is such a fascinating topic. I mean, um, Ishiguru in his book, The Buried Giant, um, it's through, through, through much of his career, Ishiguru talks about individual memory and how flawed it is. But then his book, The Buried Giant, is referring to the buried giant of memory. If we remember, will it be catastrophic for us as a nation? Mm. Is one of the things that he discusses in that book. In Vietnam, if they really remember the, 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 the trauma of colonialism, the trauma of war, what are the implications for that society as well? Do we need to suppress it? Is another question. Yeah. Um, to go alongside um, Lin as a character, there's also this marvellous relationship with uh, Bao Nguyen, mm. um, who I, I took a long while to like, I've got to say. Oh, did you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tell us about that relationship because it is fierce. Oh, she's a gangster, and, but she's also becomes a private investigator as well. You, you need that in your noir novel. You need your private investigator. But uh, Bao is her... I don't want to give any spoils, but he's her mentor and he's her boss in this gang that she's in. And he is cultivating her for leadership. But his methods are extraordinarily violent and brutal. Mm. Um, but he is something of a father figure for someone who doesn't have a father, who never knew one. Um, and it's... Uh, how can you put it? It's almost as though he wants to strengthen her in some ways through violence and trauma. Sort of vulcanising steel or something. Yes, like yeah. Um, so that is a very fraught relationship. But... It's strange as a writer, like I kind of love the characters and I oh, yeah. can't end, understand why anyone would find them <laughs> objectionable <laughs> and then someone will say, oh man, but he essentially tortures her for 300 pages. I'm like, oh yeah, there's that bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, damn. Collective memory loss. <laughs> <laughs> but I think of, but you think of, um, I suppose when you're writing characters, you're, you're writing, especially when you're writing hard-boiled or noirish characters, you, you know that they have this a deep humanity, but it's so obscured with so much. Mm. It's obscured by trauma, it's obscured by violence, it's obscured by their positions in society. Mm. Um, and so I think sometimes that's maybe a flaw, is that I sometimes forget that I, like I love them, but I've got to remind the reader why they should love them too. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you get there. You definitely do. You get there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and as well as, as what we're doing in the future, if we leave aside the technology for a moment, which I'll come back to, but we are also... Um, reading a story within a story which is mm. set in the past in the Vietnam War. And, and it's a very sharp reminder of just how grubby and violent, I mean, war mm. is violence, but how violent personally that combat was. Yeah, it was important for me to do that because I think one of the themes, if you're going to write about Vietnam, I think you've got to think about its history and we in the West, think about the American War, as they call it, the Vietnam War. But we don't go back before then. We don't know that Vietnam, Vietnam was occupied, colonised by a thousand years by China. Mm. And it was one of the very few, maybe it's the only colony that threw off Chinese rule. Mm. But this is still, this is still sh sharp in the minds of Vietnamese people. So what I wanted to... One of the things about Vietnam has been this pawn of empires, the Chinese Empire the French, the Japanese for a short time, the Americans. And partly to go back in time to that grubby conflict was to look at those cycles of history um, and look at... It was two things. It was partly about the cycles of history and, the, and how this country has been the pawn of empires, but also to look at how that trauma was suppressed. And this is why in the, in the um, novel I mentioned, another novel called The Sorrow of War, mm. which is one of the classics of Vietnamese literature and really changed my view of the country. So I was living in Vietnam, I lived there for three years, and it was kind of, it shamed me in a way because I read this novel by Bao Ninh and it's, it was a revelation about the Vietnamese trauma of the Vietnam War 
Sorry, I'm going on a bit too long. But no, we no, have... I was just going to ask you, is that, incidentally, the two names, Bao Lin, are Bao and Lin in this book? Is, is that coincidence or design? Bao is... Pr- Bao, his first name is based off the author name, I think, because he's... Uh, if you look at it, go look at his author's photo online. Hmm. It, it'll, it'll, it's, in my brain, it's how he looks in the book. Mm. Okay. But what I, I very quickly want to say was, we know about American trauma. We hear it all the time about PTSD. What we never heard about was the Vietnamese trauma, but it wasn't just the fact that we, would, we denied it in Western cinemas, say. The Vietnamese government actively suppressed mm. the notion that a Vietnamese soldier could be traumatised, mm. right? So his book came out, The Sorrow of War, and it was the all-time bestseller. Why? This is 10 years after the end of the Vietnam War. It was the first time someone talked about Vietnamese trauma. Mm. And it was... It touched this core of who they were. Mm. And it was banned briefly, but then it was allowed to be published again. And so I wanted to talk about that because that, that the Vietnam, Vietnam, Vietnam War is a classic example of something where trauma has been suppressed. Mm. Um, and there's this cycle of it in Vietnamese history. Yeah. The, um, Marg, while, while we're talking about the matters that require a bit of fortitude as a reader, you describe um, in excruciating detail a snake bite. Mm. And oh. what struck me about this as a reading experience was how you did the medical stuff. Yeah. How did you know about all that? So um, I knew that my friend Grant had been bitten by a brown snake before. Yeah. And he, that was when he was living in Canberra. And he, and I asked him about it. I said, what, what was it like? Tell me everything. So it was pretty much similar to, to in the book. He was reaching down, just getting, picking up something that he dropped in the bush and um, a snake bit him and he said it was a brown snake he didn't know that immediately but he said what he immediately felt was the weight of it because it clung on the oh it's just <laughs> I, felt, I find it so disgusting the weight and so he was wriggling his but it was cl- it clung on tw- tight for in his mind for minutes but it was probably only a couple of seconds yeah but he was uh, and the weight of it clinging on and Finally, he flung it away. He flung it over a creek. He flung it over. <laughs> he flung, and it just sort of flung away like a ribbon. And um, and then he got in the car. He called the ambulance and the the, the he called the hospital. And of course, it must have been in Canberra. Must have, he, he might have been like in Batlow. He, anyway, he wasn't in Canberra at the time. And they said to him, "How much do you weigh? Where are you? How long? You've got this far to drive." it'll be quicker for you to drive in rather than to get an ambulance. What are you doing the right things? And so all of that, all of that was true. All of that wrote, rung from a true story. And then incidentally, he, after that accident, it was quite, tr- he was in hospital for a long time and he was, he was a very big bloke and he became very, very skinny, very, very skinny after that. It, um, it affected him for a long time, mm. the, the snake bite. But yeah, I found that, um, oh, I hate snakes. <laughs> I, I respect them, but oh, I see too weird. many of them. One time we're at the, when we were living in the Warbies again, we had a little pool and um, my, I heard my little son yell out, there's a snake up my leg and I looked out and the snake had been in the pool and it was trying to get out and it went up Eddie's leg. Oh, it was horrible. It, oh. But the other interesting thing about the bite that you describe, and it sounds like maybe also the friend, is that the snake has got a sufficiently good chunk of the victim that, yes. that they're hanging from them yeah. and yet um, Ariti's not, not envenomated very much. No, and I've, I've probably taken a bit of... Um, artistic license there okay um thank god but that, but that can happen though you know yeah. if it's they 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 the it, it, that can happen where when when they bite you it's not always it's not always terrible and in that case when it was digging in so deeply probably he would have been but i um i needed him for the rest mm. of the book and let's so. not go there yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um Marg, I wanted to talk to you about um, landscape because mm. it's a thing you do so brilliantly. Mm. And maybe a way of introducing the topic is to have you read a little bit, okay. if I may. Put my glasses on. I um, clean them for a while. There. So you'll see what I've marked. Thank you, Jock. OK. Um, it's gloomy out there. Mark wasn't sure why he said it, a general unease about the place, but it was true. The bush on the other side of the road was dense and dark. It was difficult to imagine stone houses, let alone a thriving mining community. Yes, Evie said, it's because of the blackwood wattle and acacia. It's everywhere in the bush. 
The bark is deep grey, almost black, and the wood stains a dark colour. En masse, the effect is one of tenebrosity. Evie's voice had a BBC ring to it, her words knowledgeable. And what did an effect of tenebrosity mean? Time to crack open the Funkin' Wagnalls. <laughs> it used to frighten the early settlers, Evie continued. No landmarks, they said, and it was the same, dark and grey and green. Little children went missing in the bush here, never to be seen, and their mothers went mad. A bird wheeled high in the sky, and Evie followed its progress as she spoke. Settlers dreamed of Wordsworth's dancing daffodils, but what they got was this. Ripped off, Mark thought. But then, for half the year, the whole bush here blooms and the blackwood flowers in yellow and white. It's amazing. Yes, Mark didn't find it amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I love that little curl at the end. <laughs> um, what I think is so interesting there is that sense of um, Australian settlement mm. as being like a flea on an animal or something. Mm. That mm. It, it evokes hanging rock. It mm. evokes so much of, mm. of settlers planting oak mm. trees to try and replicate home mm. that... that You've really captured the alienness of being on the continent. Mm. Is that a thing that you feel strongly in your work? Yeah, I think it's. I think it's really interesting. And I spent when I was doing my PhD, I spent you know a long time thinking about that. I think it's Peter Reed. It was Peter Reed, um, the reviewer or critic, who said that um, Australians are almost obsessed with this idea of missing children and, and losing people in the bush and. Um, going mad in the bush. And certainly if you chart our literature, our white literature from, from the first days of settlement, it's, it's, um, it's true. One of our first early writers, Mary Vidal, a white woman early on, wrote about um, going mad in the bush, having children and going mad. Henry Lawson, for all, for all we love of Henry Lawson with his larrikin characters, wrote about the bush in incredibly disparaging ways. The bush is mundane, dreary. Sorry. Can you still hear me? <laughs> Dreary, um, better when the moon shines on it. Um, boring, sends a man mad. Good for a week, not for a year. You know, all these things. And I, I find that really interesting um, about that's how our early early settlers found that. It's changed, of course, but, yeah. but it, in literature it took a while. Yeah, yeah. Um, Mark has also written a great collection of stories called Rural Dreams, which touches on some of that work, doesn't yes, it? Yes, yeah, yeah, it does. Um, but you've also, in addition to the landscape on its surface, you've created a kind of Hades here. There's an underworld going on at Stonetown, mm. based around what uh, mining remnants, I suppose. Yes, mining remnants. And, of course, I live in Beechworth, which is an old mining town, and you can go down some of those old mines, and Borough certainly you can as well. So, and, and, you know, Bendigo. I spend a bit of my time growing up in Bendigo. So Australia's full of this, yeah, underworld, this Hades world where people scurried and lived and tried, toiled for years and years. Yeah, it's, it's a part of our iconography, I suppose, we don't think about much, is that a lot of these people were in the dark yes. for years yeah, at a time. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I talked about that um, with Chris Hammer recently because he's laid, he's, one of his books, Treasure and Dirt, is set in Opal Mining Town, and he found that really interesting too, that... Um, so much of you know wealth and, and those towns like Bendigo the, is is because of that underworld. Yeah, mm. yeah, and Kalgoorlie sits on the edge yeah. of the super pit. Yes, it's, it's yeah. gigantic. Yeah. Um, Tim, if we could have a little reading from you, and I've marked that a bit as well. I'll hand that across to you. Sorry, Mark. The new Vietnamese leadership had recognised the cultural and scientific superiority of their big brother to the north and agreed to live in harmony within the rightful world order. Their puppet, President Nguyen Van Huang, travelled to Beijing to acknowledge China as the nation that saved the world from climate change, change shutting down every coal-fired power station and closing every coal mine at savage cost to its own people. China, the country that brought stability to the global system after the collapse of the Western economies, but more than anything, to assure Beijing that the peaceful southern land recognised its privileged historical position within the Chinese realm. Zhao Xi was the southernmost province for 900 years until Vietnam rebelled. Now it had returned to the, fo to the fold, its manifest destiny as part of the Middle Kingdom. Mm. Thank you. I'm glad you wore the T-shirt you did because um, <laughs> that, that sense of a forked tongue there is so Orwell, isn't it? 
Oh, the double think, yeah. Yeah, particularly yeah. the rightful world order and that, that sort of obsequious language when, and in fact, it's a critique. Oh, I mean, I think, you know, we were, I think we're living in an Orwellian present to some mm. extent with the amount of surveillance we already have over us. I mean, in fact, we live in a, we, we live in a time where Orwell would be stunned at the level mm. of surveillance that we can already um, bring to bear. Um, but uh, from the Vietnamese perspective, yeah, sometimes they have to speak with that double tongue as well if they're going to survive. Um, we were, I was talking to Jock about this before we, we went on. Um, when I was living in Vietnam, I was saying to my, speaking to my Vietnamese friends and I was talking about the novel and I said, oh, so I'm going to imagine this future where um, China has invaded again. Uh, what, do you, what do you think about this idea? And they're like, China's already invaded. Oh. It's here now. It's already happening. So there was this sense, this deep historical sense there, but also an urgency about the present mm. and about the decline of the West and about a Chinese century. And I, because I lived for a decade in Southeast Asia, my, my views were always shaped by the neighbours China's neighbours and, and those countries on the, on the border. Uh, and so that, that sort of world view or cosmology, I think, has certainly shaped some of the ideas in my writing, yeah. Yeah, and there's, there's a chauvinism about the way we think about history. Mm. That I, I recently spoke to Linda Javen, she's written a, a history of China. And it's so accessible and great, but you also get this amazing sense of the depth of the history. Yeah. And we can get so caught up in our world and our present that we... we think of our own presence on this continent as being so dominant and important and it's tiny and you make the point that the same thing happened with the American war in Vietnam that it's actually a tiny moment in history compared to the long struggle with the Chinese. Yeah, I mean the there's a there's a fa there's a famous quote from uh, um, Ho Chi Minh which I think is in the book uh, and some people say it's apocryphal, but this, this tells you a lot about uh, uh, Vietnamese history. They were saying after the Japanese were kicked out, um, after the Second World War, they had to have governance over the country. And I can't remember, I, I think someone said to Ho Chi Minh, well, who do you want to have coming in to govern? Mm. Do you want the French or do you want the Chinese? And he said, the French. And they said, oh, why? Why, do you, why is it such an easy decision? He said, well, I'd rather smell French farts for five years than eat Chinese dung for 500. <laughs> um, because Brutal. he knew the French were amateurs and they were going to leave. Yeah. But for him, he understood the longer game too and the longer game of Vietnamese history. Um, again, this is speculative fiction. This is just a what if, but it's a what if that is drawn from the, the DNA threads of, of the possible that exist in our present. Mm. Yeah. Um, and so if I say, well, what if America collapsed mm. and what if China was the sole superpower, what would that look like? Mm. That's not an implausible scenario. Mm. Mm. And I think the view, as you say, we're very Western-centric and we, just, we, 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 we think about it from um, our particular position and sometimes we even think about it because our brains are colonised we think about it from the American view mm -hmm. but what about the view from Southeast Asia and what do they think of this coming so called Asian century yeah. um, uh, which is a cool kind of background that you can have to, to explore the, to have your character um, you know, have an adventure in I suppose mm. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you about some of the really neat technological tricks you've got in this book the ones that, that really struck me were there, there's the retin retinal implant that provides sort of holographic information, I guess. Mm. Um, there's this experience called Fat Victory, mm. which reminded me so much of Infinite Jest. And I wondered if that was a, a reference point. I haven't read it. Oh, there you go. Um, <laughs> it, because it's written in the 90s, it's a VHS tape, but you watch this thing and it becomes hypnotic and you can't leave and people would die watching infinite jest. Ah. Um, in fact, victory was a bit like that. Ah. Um, and then there's the, the injury healing that we, we just referred to, but also a drug. Was, is it I-7? Is that the right name? Yeah. Can you tell me where these things come from? And oh, God, that's that? a lot of questions. Uh, yeah, sorry. 
Um, where do they come from? A lot of it is a lot of it is uh, extrapolating on what we have now. Like we we have our smartphones. People carry the bloody things everywhere. They monitor us wherever we go. Um, we use them as a kind of exo memory. Um, we've always had exo memory as a civilization. Whether it's we put it in libraries or we paint it on walls or sometimes we have we choose people in our society who who keep our old traditions. That's all forms of exo memory. But we have in our phones, like the sum of human knowledge is in our pocket. Um, and there's all these fascinating implications for that, including one of them is I won't I won't. I'm kind of starting to digress. One of them is cognitive offloading, where we don't actually use our brains anymore mm. for a lot of our memory recall. We use our phone. And so a lot of our memory functions are actually declining. But my what if was, well, we've got this, we carry this bloody thing everywhere. If we could stick it in our heads, would we? Of course we would. <laughs> and people would get the implant and then they have the internet in their head. And, yeah. and then we talk about... <laughs> it's horrible. They would. They would, 100%, oh. and that's why... Would they? Would you? No, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> but that's why in the book, there's a, a, the omissioner, and omissioner was, um, uh, in the novel, is someone who has no implant, and they are an expert on memory and healing memory, and they have excellent natural memory. But I got that from Chinese history. An omissioner was someone who served the emperor and would stand next to him, and then they would come in, and if there was some, some part of history that the emperor wouldn't know about, the omission would be there, and he'd be the exo-memory banks containing all the things about tradition and Chinese history and so forth. So I got that from Chinese history. Oh, and put that's it in the it. Iliad too. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. So the, in terms of the, um, the, the, the implants, that was very much just, well, what's the next smartphone going to be in 100 years? And could, would we put it in our heads? Probably. And then I think I imagine like where we can we can see things on retina. So I can look at you, and then but I can have little tags saying maybe your names. I can see Jock, and then I might have a little prompt saying something witty at the bottom and it, <laughs> tell me what to say. <laughs> um, uh, so that that came from that. But so much of my stuff comes from just extrapolating on. And again, of course, will we ever have it in our head? I don't know. But will we become ever more addicted and ever more dependent on some smartphone equivalent? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and so part of, you know, I think science fiction, when it's very good, can explore some mm. of the, 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 the trajectories of our future. Mm. Um, what were the other texts? The drugs, I, got, I basically took a reference from a Kurt Vonnegut novel and then twisted it, and then I thought... What's a really cool drug? And I'll put it in there. I had a reviewer complaining about the, all the drugs in the novel. Well, I think that's an important <laughs> point, actually, is that Lynn's an addict. Mm. And that, that, to me, not only the, the drug, but also alcohol, that, mm. to me, felt really contemporary and universal. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, it's her... People with... So I worked in aid before I was a writer, and I certainly, in that industry, has very high levels of burnout and, uh, and PTSD. And I was there at a time when the, the, which is not that long ago, 10 years or 15 years, 10 years, where nothing was really done for people who'd gone through very traumatic situations working in, say, humanitarian aid. And people self-medicate. Of course, we all know this. We self-medicate through drugs and we self-medicate through, um, uh, well, through various things. But in Lynn's case, it's drugs and it, it's alcohol and drugs. And that's also kind of a classic for a, a noir protagonist, is that you've, for, you very often you have someone who does have substance abuse problems because maybe they are trying to treat, medicate this trauma that they've gone through. Yeah. Um, but they've never, they never want to rely on anyone else to help them to do it. Yeah. Um, Marg, can we go back to Hades for a moment? Mm. Um, I, I want to be really careful about what I ask you here in case I, I cause a spoiler, but... We have a person trapped underground, mm. and you very cleverly increase the reveal each time we visit this person mm. trapped underground until we understand exactly who the person is and what's going on. Mm. Um, how did you imagine the experience of that person, and how did you pace it out like that? So I imagined the experience because 
uh, well, I know what it feels like because I, or I don't know what it feels like to be trapped, but I know what it feels like to be underground in a mine and have your older brothers and your older cousins running off in your other... <laughs> so in Bendigo, <laughs> I grew up um, apart for a couple of years. We lived in White Hills, which is now um, quite suburbanised. But um, it, there's lots of mine shafts there. So all the kids would... Um, and it seems so terrible now, but we would lower each other down with um, <laughs> rope and run away and, <laughs> and, um, and sit at the and then um, this is worse than snakes, by the way. Yeah, it's worse than snakes. And then um, you know, for a trick, sometimes people would would pull up the rope and you would and run away and you'd be left there. And even if you were left there just for three minutes, mm. I found it really terrifying mm. because even though because the foliage. Because a lot of the, and we know in Beechworth too, a lot of the whole, it's hard to find, you know, they're, they're hidden. So you can look up and you can see glimpses of sunlight, but also there's all these passages um, that you could that you could go through and some are dead ends and some are not. So I sort of use that experience and um, of just remembering that, those in, that initial fear. But when I was writing it um, too, I read a lot of stuff about people who were trapped in mines and how they felt and claustrophobia. Yeah. So I, I, I wrote, a, I read about those, um, and, and you know, just imagine that. You know, we're fiction yeah, writers, yeah. Um, um, Jock. You know what it's like. We just your mind likes to go to hor really horrible places. Um, we all try to learn, don't we, do in, we, in our fiction, to use all of the senses. Yes, yeah. And you can get lazy and forget and just mm. go visual for pages on yeah. end. But because of that dark experience, mm. someone told me about, I forget where it is, but there's a restaurant where it, it's run by blind people and it's oh, yes. totally yeah. dark. Yeah. And you have to go through the whole meal, including if you need to go to the toilet. Yeah. Mm. Everything is yes. done by being guided by I others. I thought that was in Melbourne. Is it? Yeah. 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 But, but w this is really sensory writing mm. in the sense that we imagine the feeling around, the listening, the smelling. Well, it was it one of the brilliant panels? Maybe the one I've just been to, was it? Or, oh, yes, where Jason asked you about sound. Mm. Mm. And, um, yeah, I, I like the sensory things. E seeing is kind of easiest in a way to write about, isn't it? But the sounds, it's, I think it's more palpable. So I, I do try and do that, yes. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, now, I'll ask you all for your questions in just a second, so, so make sure you've thought up something to ask. But um, g given where we are on the clock, I probably should come around to the theme of the panel. Mm. Um, <laughs> what, what was that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, the panel. So, so here's the great alchemy. Mm. <laughs> um, both of these books are Australian noir. Mm. And yet they are vastly, vastly different mm. books. And you're different people. Mm. Um, hopelessly open-ended question. What is Australian noir and how come you're both writing it with two completely different but, books? Buzz, you go first. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I, I, I will, I'll say one thing about the setting that, that connects our books. Um, the dark city and the Australian outback mm. seem completely different. What the hell have they got to do with each other in terms of setting? Mm. But the dark city in hard world fiction, in noir, is an alienating place. Yes, alienating. It's oppressive. Mm. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's an environment that is hostile. Mm. But what that is very often is the environment out without reflects the environment within. The environment without reflects the psychological disposition of the protagonist. Mm. And noir protagonists are often very alienated. If you're in the outback, in the unblinking sun, in this oppressive landscape, you said we were the flea uh, on the flea back on the of the beast. <laughs> I called my short story collection uh, Neon Leviathan. Mm. You, can, you can think of the outback as Leviathan, mm. indifferent, mm. cruel, and hostile. But those characters can be walking through an environment where it reflects their internal disposition. Mm. And, and it is their internal disposition, isn't it? Because really, the outback, the Australian land, the, the landscape, it doesn't care about us. It's no, just there. It's, it not, it's actually not hostile. Mm. And it's not, you know, it, it's, it's what it is. Yeah. Mm. And it's us that impose all these fears on them. Yeah, we didn't get to talk about it, but there's certainly, if you look at Indigenous noir and uh, mm. Noir written by non-Indigenous people, you see this very different treatment mm. of the environment. But what I was getting at is what connects it is the environment without reflects the disposition of the, the psychological alienation of the protagonist. And you can have that in 
the desert mm. and you can have that in the dark city. And mm. I think there is a connection. Yeah. And that, that sense of enormity and indifference, mm. um, I, I think, you, you know, you write about the outback and, and when I've written about the ocean, I, I feel that as well, that it's mm. complete indifference to human fate. Mm -hmm. um, and then I read, you might know, Tim, Stanislaw Lim's, um, what's that book called? Which not, is... Not Solaris. Solaris. Yeah. The, the notion is that a planet is only ocean um, and humans are exploring it tentatively, but the ocean is sentient, it thinks. Mm. And, and it thinks some pretty nasty thoughts from memory. Wow. Mm. Um, but you can do a lot, can't you, with that sense of yeah. indifference? Yeah. Yeah. And what about the visuals of, well, both stories? If I, I was going through the thinking exercise reading these books about how they would work on the screen, and, and <laughs> leaving aside plot, for you, Tim, what I came to was Blade Runner, yeah, sure. Good. And I think for you, Marg, I came to Mystery Road. Ah, um, so thank you. I think, all, <laughs> I think all of us as writers kind of dream, oh, one day, you know, a director's mm. going to ring up and say, hey, mm. let's film this. Yeah, when's that um, going to happen? When's that going to happen? Yeah. <laughs> it's like waiting for a boy to call, you know. <laughs> and the boy's probably mm. not organised. Um, <laughs> but it would, they would be enormously different tasks, wouldn't they, representing mm. these two stories visually? Mm. Yeah. Gosh, Tim, I'd love to see yours, Tim, on yeah. film. Wouldn't it be great? Yes, it'd, it would. Can you talk so to nice. someone? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it'd be... Help me out. It'd be brilliant. Um, yeah, it would. I mean, every writer dreams that, don't they? Yeah. I, yeah. It, it, it hardly ever happens, though, does it? I think when Jane Harper got the dry made into... We all cheered, didn't we? We're yep. all cheering because it's one. And now her second one's being made, isn't it? Force of Nature, it? Right. which is wonderful. But um, it's yeah. so rare. Yep. It really is. Mm. It really is. Yeah. But Blade Runners are good. Sure, I'd take that. I yep. had a I had a Vietnamese reader who said it could be an anime, a Japanese anime. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I'd I'd 100% take either. Could it be a game? Uh, I'd, the, could, the, so there's a game. There's a game within the story. It could there could mm. definitely be a, a game? Yeah. I don't. I don't think the the, thi the, the interesting thing about film noir and cyberpunk is how visual it is. And mm. so it's kind of interesting. I was on a panel, a, a, a different noir panel, a virtual one, and we were discussing, people were discussing influences on their, on their noir or their cyberpunk. And they all mentioned film. Mm. Mm. And it's interesting to write in a, in a sort of a subgenre that's a very visual one mm. at the same time. Um, but what I was getting to is there's obviously there's some amazing video games out there that, that are, have amazing visuals. But no, I don't think it could be a video game. No. Okay. Mm. Okay. Um, all right, on that note, we're going to throw it over to you guys. Um, would anyone like to ask a question? I think there's a mic that comes around. Um, there's a question at the front here. Thank you. Uh, I just wondered with... I've noticed that the, um, you know, some novels end up putting in little mechanisms that oh, that looks like might be good in a movie. <laughs> Have you ever addressed that issue when you're writing, saying, oh, well, maybe I'll leave that option open and here's this uh, yeah, very visual and destructive event or something, which... Oh, no. I, I, I just um, hope and pray that each one will be published, you know, if it's a bonus. <laughs> it's a bonus if my I, mum... I wish if I my was, dad, you know, yeah. finishes it the whole way through... Let alone, <laughs> <laughs> let alone if a publishing company picks it up. No, I don't think that 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 far ahead. I think if I did think, if you did start thinking like that, it might change the way you write. Yeah. Perhaps. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. I think no, if you were going to think like that, there's things you would deliberately leave out. Right. Like yeah. water scenes. Yes. Animals. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> I'm stuffed. <laughs> yeah. Your water. Yeah. yeah water. Yeah. yeah. Mm. No, I'm not that Machiavellian. I, I just <laughs> imagine that, and this will be the uh, the great scene in the. No, no, who, I don't think. Maybe there are writers who think that way, but it's awfully like American. you, I just want to get published. One, and mm. two, I want to write the story that I want to read. You know, yeah. you write write mm. this, and I never think about that. I think if you, I, I find writing, um, and I know, and when I used to write short stories for literary journals and stuff, I found it a torture. <laughs> I, I, I did. I found it really, really difficult. I applaud. I take my hats off every day. I salute short story writers. Mm. But I found, when I started writing crime fiction, I found it a joy. 
I found it a mm. joy, a joy, and I'm, I look forward to it. It's like a mm. treat. It's like a Tim Tam after dinner. I, love, <laughs> I, I just, oh, I, I feel so fortunate, to, and I, I love it. So if it gets published, bonus. If it doesn't, it doesn't, you did, know. Did you see there was that short story panel at Port Ferry where one of those writers talked about being asked the question, oh, do you write short stories because you can't write a novel yet? I know. <laughs> I know. I couldn't believe that. Yeah. Oh. It's so much harder to write a short story. It's, it's very, so it's much very hard. harder. Yeah, it's yes. Yeah. <laughs> Hats anyway. off. Mm. Yes. Um, anyone else out there in the middle? Hi. I was wondering if you could tell me your most influential novel that you've ever read or... What, you've, oh, what we'd recommend mandatory reading uh -huh. for uh, for, <laughs> for noir, uh, I'd say uh, maybe Dashiell Hammett, uh, maybe Red Harvest, maybe, or The, the Maltese Falcon, if it's just for noir, and it has to be a book. Yes. Oh, but I, they're both influential I, novels. I, I, impossible, I have so isn't? many... I have so many... I love... Like, I'm an okay writer, but I think I'm a really good reader. I, that's, what I, that's what I'd like on my tombstone that I read. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I've just, I, I keep picking up Engleby um, by Sebastian Fawkes. I pick up Engleby all the time, his book. I think it's, in terms of unreliable narrators, I think it's brilliant. Um, I love Margaret Atwood. I love Barbara Bainton, um, the, her bo early Bush studies, Bush. From, uh, so I love... I can't say. I must say the person who made me fall in love with crime and Australian crime was, of course, Peter Temple. Mm. Um, I felt so sad when Peter Temple died. I, ne I never got to meet him, but um, mm. he was the person who made me think crime can be beautiful. Yeah, mm. yeah absolutely right. Yeah. Anybody so else? Sorry. It's too Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> That's because oh, yeah. I was retreating into compare mode then. I was hoping <laughs> I wouldn't be. Um, I, I think books are like friends and that you mm. need different ones for different needs. Yes. Um, so it's impossible to rank your mates. Yeah. But um, I'll do it anyway. <laughs> um, Crime and Punishment is, is one of the few novels yeah. I've gone back to again and again. Um, and there's a book that almost no one reads called Seven Tenths by uh, a writer called James Hamilton Patterson, mm. which he wrote in the early 90s. And it's non-fiction about his theories about how we relate to the ocean. Um, sounds boring. It's absolutely beautiful because mm. he brings in lots of songwriting and poetry and science and history and weird little anecdotes. And he's threading a little mini novel through it as he's writing the non-fiction mm. about an incident where he nearly drowned. And... Um, the whole thing's just so gorgeously constructive and really sad on climate change because he wrote it in 92 and everything he said has been disregarded mm. and here we are. You know? Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, sorry, yes. Last one. Last one, apparently, yeah. It's possibly more for, for Tim. Um, what place does hope have oh. in dystopian fiction? Uh, I think that <clears throat> the hope in cyberpunk and the hope in dystopian novels for me is that they're a humanist literature and there's hope in human defiance and there's hope in human rebellion and there's and if they're dark and gritty and cynical it's because they believe deeply that the human spirit matters uh, and so for mine there's it, it, it depends on the dystopia we're talking about but for me, the good ones are deeply humanist, even, as, even in their bleakness. All right, folks, um, I'm afraid that's the wrap-up. Um, things to say to you at the end here, and I have a handy list, are, of course, book sales and signing just out in the lobby. Um, coming up next, please stay around, because we've got the final discussion with um, Jason Steger and Michelle de Kretzer uh, about her novel, Scary Monsters, um, which, of course, is the book of the festival. And... Um, I think in as little as 10 minutes' time, we've also got our gig by the Stiff Gins, which will be fantastic. Mm. So make sure you stick around for that one. Um, can you join with me, please, in thanking Tim Napper and Marg Hickey? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to Jock, oh, too. Thank you. Thank you, Jock. Oh.